Here at The Regenerative Journey, we know that good health is related to good food and good practices, but understand that sometimes the right food choices are quite hard to put into place. But our good buddy, Cindy O'Meara at The Nutrition Academy is helping people break old habits to create a much healthier lifestyle. So in support of what she's doing, we're offering a $100 discount to all our listeners. Simply enroll in their functional nutrition course and enter the coupon CHARLIE100, that's CHARLIE100, The Nutrition Academy. Say goodbye to old food habits and hello to a much healthier, happier life. I think uh, in agricultural landscapes that you're, you're dreaming a little bit if you think you can get back to what was there before. Uh, now we're facing climate change and now, um, as, as Nick Reid presented yesterday, uh, all the, all the modelling showing uh, that the how regions are going to change and, and potentially, you know, wipe out uh, native species that are very adapted to some areas. That was Michael Taylor, and you're listening to The Regenerative Journey. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and internationally, and their continuing connection to country, culture, community, land, sea and sky. And we pay our respects to Elders past, present and emerging. G'day, I'm your host Charlie Arnott, an eighth-generational Australian regenerative farmer. And in this podcast series... I'll be diving deep and exploring my guests' unique perspectives on the world so you can apply their experience and knowledge to cultivate your own transition to a more regenerative way of life. Welcome to The Regenerative Journey with your host, Charlie Arnott. Quick plug for our upcoming workshops, our Introduction to Biodynamics workshops, they're two days, and the next one will be on the 2nd and 3rd of December at the farm at Byron Bay, up there in the northern rivers of New South Wales. That's a Thursday, Friday. Uh, Then the next week, on the 7th and 8th of December, we'll be here at Hanamino Burua, where it all started. Come along, we may be doing a farm tour uh, also um, on the day before or the day after that one. And then we'll slip into, into autumn next year or late summer. Uh, we're planning to be in Tasmania in February for all you Taswegians. Um, really looking forward to seeing you guys down there. Hopefully be in Victoria in March. Um, in April, we uh, want to be back down there with our good buddies. Uh, some of our wine-growing buddies in the, um, the Barossa and McLaren Vale uh, in South Australia, in sunny South Australia. And in May, we are hoping to slip across to Western Australia. Um, stay tuned, jump on the charliearnett.com.au website and the events page there to see um, all the details on tickets and hope to see you at one of them. G'day, today's episode is with Michael Taylor. Um, I sat with him at his beautiful um, farm, I'm actually still here, a um, uh, little bit of wind there so excuse me for that. Um, here it's, it's farm, his family farm, uh, east of Kentucky, which is south of Armadale in the New England of New South Wales. Beautiful family property. We talked about a lot about tree planting, actually, which is wonderful because um, I'm a mad keen tree planter, especially oaks and other exotic species. Um, we talked about silvo pasture. We talked about agroforestry um, and all the associated lingo and words around that and uh, definitions. Um, his life, moving, up, growing up here and moving away. Um, from the farm for some time and then coming back and and that journey um it was and it was wonderful to sit here in the sun first time with a cap and sunglasses on for the glare um overlooking this beautiful part of the new england and uh, i hope you enjoy this episode with michael taylor as much as i did okay michael taylor here we are welcome to the regenerative journey thanks charlie Welcome to your, <laughs> welcome to the bit of grass on the sunny side of your studio, um, here just outside of Kentucky. Taylor's Run. Taylor's Run. It's uh, Taylor's Run's our wool brand, and mm. and uh, I've I've um, taken that <laughs> that name, but that Taylor's Run was actually coined when all the tailors were were marketing their wool as one, but. Um, yeah, Terrible Vale is the the original run. It was Terrible Vale Run, eighteen thirty nine. Terrible Vale, and I know it's where I drove out on Terrible, Terrible vale, vale Road. Road. Yep, yep. So um, let's well, let's talk about that now then. So what? Wh- wh- when did the tailors get here? Eighteen thirty nine. 
It's truth. So, because we want to talk about your just, story, just but there's, the a bit of, there's a little bit of backstory there. <laughs> yeah, 1839. Yeah. And, and did they name it Terrible Vale? <clears throat> no, they actually, it was Terrible Valley. Um, so I think they did actually change it to, they named it Terrible Vale, but I think it was Terrible Valley. And there's a bit of, a few stories. I, I think uh, Terrible vale, Valley, uh, you know, first uh, white explorers up here, uh, colonisers, were uh, probably visited on a cold July day and went, Holy. <laughs> oh, terrible this as in terrible valley. Terrible as maybe, in maybe maybe it was like 2019. It was pretty dry year as well. <laughs> yeah, but they still they stayed though. <clears throat> yeah, well, the pa- that terrible. No, the pastures up up here were were phenomenal, mm. and and that's why we, you know, have the highest stocking rates in the country. Just especially just south of here, what you know, south of Walker, the mm. slightly higher rainfall. Um, so yeah, the my ancestors came out from Scotland, and uh, I, I don't know exactly what they were doing. I, they, they, their family were they were traders, but um, William Tidd was he'd been a solicitor. I think he'd studied law, and but uh, they moved to they came out to Port Macquarie originally, and there was some uh, connection with Governor Macquarie, and they. They were living on a property there for a short while. It was only a very short while, less than a year, before they moved up here and they bought uh, bought this place off a off a, one of the squatters. So there'd only been uh, white people colonising this area for only a few years, mm. really. And uh, um, yeah, so grew from there it was i think the original run was about 27,000 acres That's true. so how much you got now how much the, is there? i've only got a bit over 1800 yeah <laughs> yeah but there's there's about uh there's about 12 or 13,000 in the family so yeah. there's six seven families still Taylor here. family still here yeah still here. can't get rid of them and within what sort of you know, how close are they? Because I know your, your mum and dad's just over there. <laughs> yeah, mum and dad just there. Yeah, within hundred meters. meters. I got uncle. He's only three hundred meters behind us. Mm. Um, I got a cousin just out of sight behind the trees over there. Another one just behind the trees over there. Wow. And um, and you came in past Terrible Vale, so where the original homestead bark was a bark hut uh, was, and. Um, and then I've got uh, cousins on the other side of Walker Road as well. So, wow. But a lot of the country was then acquired, quite a bit of the country to the west of here was acquired for um, Kentucky. But, uh, for the town, for, for the, the village. For the settlement, yeah, it was a yeah. soldier's settlement after mm. the First World War. And, um, um, yeah, but there's there's been tailors in this area for... For a little while, it's really not that long. Um, we've actually been very lucky to be working, doing, doing a bit of work with the Aboriginal elders locally, and uh, it's been really interesting learning more about the history here and the Don't know. 2019 drought because that was the worst drought our family had ever been through. That Aboriginal settlements relied a lot on water, and yeah. um, uh, that highlighted where you know where the extent of uh, settlements would have been and we actually went to a spot which is a bit special, special to the tailors and uh, um, within half an hour being there we were picking up um, tool fragments and stuff wow. and uh, that we'd just never known like there was there's a little <coughs> bit of recorded history of an Aboriginal settlement just a few kilometers from the homestead but yeah you know <laughs> it's been a long while since ever, anyone's lived there. <laughs> And <clears throat> do you think is is do you think that the, the the vibe of that spot is you know the indigenous um, you know people who are here um, for many many years they obviously that was a, a spot of maybe significance for them if there were fragments there or a camp or something yeah there was there was definitely a camp there that it's sort of the it was the last the, the highest up the river that, that there was any water left right. you know from there. To the watershed, there was not, there was no permanent water. Mm. So, um, um, but yeah, I just, I just like to think about that. It puts, it, 
a lot of what we've done here to the land in perspective and um, the, the, you know, the damage we've done and the good that we've done and the things that have changed and, um, yeah, it's, it's something we often reflect on. <laughs> well, we'll get more to that. <clears throat> um, just to put it into context, uh, I've just turned, not, not long turned up. Um, we're sitting outside the studio. It's a beautiful sunny day. <laughs> it's the first time I've done an interview with a hat and glasses on because it actually is very bright out here. <laughs> and I have, I was welcomed with a cup of coffee and a, um, it's a hot cross bun. It is. And it's, and there's some, even some chocolate hiding around there too. So that w- that in itself was just <laughs> worth coming to. Um, so if we get a bit of wind, I might have to just deal with that as it happens. We're just sort of just on the on the side of it now. I'm not getting too much of the wind noise. And if you hear chewing and slurping, then I please excuse me. <laughs> I might be it a noisy morning tea time. It is. It's morning <laughs> tea time. I know. Well, that was the plan. <laughs> I've just been sitting at your front gate for an hour, going, "Oh, it's not smoke out yet." Um, so let's, I mean, there's so much to talk about. Let's, let's just get back to you, Michael, um, your early years, your regenerative journey. Where, what were you doing? Well, I mean, let's, I don't know, let's go back as far yeah, as you want right. to go. Well, where, where you were born here? Well, yeah, let's jump forward to, um, yeah, I was born, I was born here, born in Armada. You know um, what I'm going to do, sorry, before you start, I'm going to take a shoe off <laughs> and put a sock over it. On that thing. <laughs> you want me to put a sock over this one? Actually, you know what? <laughs> Ma- <laughs> you won't want me to put one of mine on it. <laughs> She's lucky I put clean socks on this morning. Oh, that's gold. Straight away. It's amazing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. It's a green sock. I've, too. I've, brought, I've taken, it sounds a little bit more muffled now, but that's, I think it's okay. Might be the. The thickness of these socks, but that's <laughs> when it happens. Winter socks, little mu- <laughs> little muffled. <laughs> Let's not get our speak- our microphones mixed up at any stage. Okay, start again, Ma- Michael. Please. Yeah, yeah. So I was I was born I was born here. Um, I've got two sisters, Rita and Catherine. Um, yeah, we grew up here. We went to went to school in Kentucky, small school there, thirty to fifty students. Ever since it was started, it's a hundred. Uh, nearly 130 years old, I think, too, so it's been around. And uh, we all went to high school in Armidale. Um, yep, survived school. Um, I discovered uh, the outdoors kayaking school. Um, talk more about that later. But, um, uh, yeah, I went off to, went off to uni. Uh, no, I actually had a year. I actually had a year on the farm first. I had my gap year. And uh, I'd got into a few different uni courses, so I wasn't. I was still a bit unsure of what I was going to do. Which uni did you end up going to? Uh, I ended up going to RMIT in Melbourne, yeah, did, right. doing civil eng. weren't te- weren't tempted to go up the road to Armadale. No, the coffee's better in Melbourne. So, <laughs> well, when I was at uni, it was there, definitely so, I mean, better in Melbourne. <laughs> oh, totally. Well, all that those years ago, there was. <laughs> There were no coffee shops. There were cafes, as we would call them, cafes like greasy, <laughs> greasy spoons. And there was a chocolate soldier and the IX, IXL cafe. Ooh. And they were pretty ordinary in the, in the mall there. Yeah. They yep. just so, well, yep. look, they were yep. adequate up yep. with a hangover. Yeah. So, okay, <laughs> good reason not to go to Armadale. No, look, Armadale didn't offer industrial design or architecture or engineering. And, and I was interested in those building kind of things um yeah i kind of uh i'd I'd kind of taken uh the land a little bit for granted and uh you know all the biology and ecology and everything that i could have learnt. um yeah i I didn't didn't feel it desperate to to go out and learn a lot i'd been exposed to a lot through my parents um, yeah, I guess I, I grew up, I grew up planting, you know, my, my, my parents have been planting trees here since the early eighties. So, um, I was reasonably young. I was still in primary school so, and we were dragged around every winter planting trees and, uh, my parents had a contract tree planting business for a while. So, you know, most of the old pines you see, not the old, old, but the eighties onwards pines that planted around the New England, a lot of them were planted by my parents. Um, and, 
um, yeah, so we, yeah, I just grew up <laughs> planting trees <laughs> and, uh, and, and being out in the bush, uh, Dad's fairly adventurous. I mentioned before we used to ride bikes and race bikes, and um, but we'd often, you know, we're always away camping or trips out to Central Australia or out in the Gorge Country. Amazing, you know, amazing um, <clears throat> national park just out to the east of here. Uh, big area, bush, remote bush, and we'd spend many days uh, riding, hiking, climbing, scrambling through there. So. If uh, if I hadn't been exposed to to, to um, yeah I, yeah I was exposed to lots of different environments and my on my my parent my grandparents on my mum's side they out east of Gaira and it's uh, they've got a huge area of bush on their place and and I grew up in a family of gardeners as well gardens have always been uh, a big part of my my grandparents on both sides. And uh, and as you can see, there's you know, ten acres of garden around my parents' ten place. Acre. <coughs> ten acres, and uh, wow. and uh, yeah, but a bit, it's, a bit of a veggie garden, is it? Yeah, a bit bit of a veggie garden there, the quarter acre veggie garden. <laughs> That's nice. <laughs> and but Did you just sneak you just sneak down there now and again and steal a bit from mum and dad. Oh, actually, You've been known to do that. Actually, the, after these days, the veggies just get dumped on the back. Back door because <laughs> there's an excess. Uber eats. <laughs> <laughs> and, no, I get, I get called in for some heavy lifting, but yeah. uh, but mum and dad are working on the veggie garden there. So I've I've grown up around growing things, and my parents did a lot of plant propagation. Um, but yeah, I went off to uni and I did engineering, and I lived in in a Melbourne. For, I was down there for nearly ten years. So just just on that. Interesting that you, and maybe that's why you didn't quite have, well, I will not put words in your mouth, but you said that when I mean, you're in, living in a, um, excuse me, a family of growers, you know, plants, you know, trees, um, that was normal for you yeah. to spend your winters planting trees. Yeah. Um, that's a very earthy, you know, nature-focused kind of thing. Mm, mm. And, but, and, not but, and engineering was your passion. Yeah, well, my dad was always... Which is sort pretty, of yeah, no, we, outside of that. I guess um, they went hand in hand with a lot of the things we were doing. Mm. Um, you know, my dad built the first ever self-propelled tree planter. Um, nice. It, it, everything uh, that my parents, uh, you know, before that, mum and dad were, were selling... Um, uh, thanks. No, it's all good. <laughs> it's not no, too smelly. No, as, as my guests get... No, 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 as my guests... <laughs> <laughs> it's got, you know, as my guests get more relaxed, often I have to chase them with the microphone. <laughs> now that's all good. Yeah. So uh, saying, uh, my parents were uh, always, yeah, always looking for, for, for solutions to things, and sheep handling equipment was one of those things that my uh, father started on. For you know, he was building sheep handlers before any of the sheep handlers you see these days existed, and selling those. He was at at all the big egg field days selling those, and and uh, and apparently there's still a few old J and V Taylor sheep handlers <laughs> in museums, probably. But but um, <laughs> but that was so the mechanical side of things was always there. My dad, my dad was you know ra- racing bikes and building mm. building his own sidecars because you, you couldn't buy side motorbike and sidecars, and he and um, I'll have to recount one story about my dad's engineering because. Uh, he, uh, he and my, bro- and my, my uncle, my dad's brother, younger brother, he's about ten years younger. Uh, they used to do a lot of uh, time trials together, and Dad was bi- building the trials bike sidecars, and uh, and obviously trials bikes are light, they'd be built light, and uh, and they uh, they built this uh, built my dad built a very lightweight sidecar, and they went out and they were testing it, and um, and uh, it folded up, and. Uh, <laughs> What, did it collapse? folded up on my uncle. Oh. <laughs> so my, my Where was this on the My on dad, a, on my dad jumped off. He thought it was a great joke, but, but my uncle was there folded in the sidecar. Oh, no. So where, where back, was back where, to the Back to the drawing board. Where was he? Um, uh, was this on, on the road somewhere? On the no, no, no. This was uh, 
you know, hopping over rocks. So this is trials. Oh, um, right. Yeah, trials riding and um, – <laughs> <laughs> so, but but my mum and my mum and dad have been riding, you know, sidecars all over the country. And they're, and years, they're, and they're, they're off today. They're off chuffing around. They're in off today, and yeah, a lot of people know my dad was uh, importing the Ural sidecars into Australia. That was his retirement job. <laughs> well, I saw Ural on signposted somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> is that right? Yep. Yeah, no, <coughs> Ural. He since sold that, and that, but they're actually still based in Urala, which is appropriate. Ural's in Urala. Yeah, but um, <laughs> but uh, yeah. So the mechanical side was always uh, okay, my my, cool. my my dad could have very easily been a mechanical engineer, mm. and mm. my mum's a lace maker, and you can't see, but that there's plenty of lace bob and lace in there behind us, and that's just as complicated. Yeah. And um, so the mechanical yeah. stuff was always there. Um, my mum actually went off to uni, started architecture, so. Um, um, the the creative stuff. So I do a lot of photography as well, and uh, but that's that's come from my my mother's side. So there's there's all the all those elements mm. were there, and uh, um, <clears throat> yeah. But I did I did get out of engineering and and come back to the farm, and and uh, so I was in Melbourne for about ten years. Came back to the farm. Um, Did you I work met, down there? So you, you uni for a number of years, and, yeah. then, and then you spent some other time. Yeah, I uh, finished. Uh, well, I, I met my wife second year uni. Um, yep. That didn't take long. And um, <laughs> didn't take long. Mill- <laughs> well, it took uh, a year. Yeah, what, well, were you, what were you doing? Oh, actually, I, don't, no, I don't want to know. You're doing your first year. <laughs> <laughs> I know because my son's in first year uni at the moment. So <laughs> wow. <laughs> Try not to think about no. that. No. <laughs> what's he doing? Hey, Remy. <laughs> what's he What's he studying there? Uh, or where, which he's, uni? He's doing what's aerospace that? systems engineering. Holy smoke! Which is so. My wife Millie, she did aerospace systems engineering. She came on exchange out from France, and um, when we moved back to the farm here, the shearers knew her. She was the rocket scientist. <laughs> That's a classic. But, uh, Typical thing for sure to say. That's a classic. <laughs> You're very funny. But uh, <clears throat> yeah, so look, I, I I did actually. I worked I worked in consulting for a while, but uh, when we started having kids, um, I actually took took uh, quit engineering and stayed at home with the kids, and mm. and that's when I took up photography full time because that was sort of flexible. And I did that on the weekends, and Millie and I would often go out to events and. So, um, events, yeah. events being horse, horse, horse events, okay. mountain biking. Look, ma- right. uh, mountain biking was always a big thing for us in Melbourne. Lots of bikes. So, mm. um, living in in a Melbourne, so and, you'd, uh, you'd, lots you'd, of friends that were mountain biking. And so you'd get out of Melbourne on your you know, <coughs> cruising around wherever. A lot of bikes actually in Melbourne. Lots there? of bikes. It was early days. Um, it was just taking off as a photographer. Um, there weren't many photographers at events and mm. a lot of the events were way out in the bush so mm. we sort of had it to ourselves a few of us that were covering a lot of the events mm. these days you you're going to elbow your way in past is that right everybody everybody's got a digital camera <laughs> actually there's well, so many phones totally. I mean, phones are <laughs> well here we are we're, we're, on, we are. we're on one right now oh, so michael if i have um, <clears> been <throat> toying with the idea of getting a mountain bike um well, I don't even know if it's supposed to be a you know, mountain bike that is, you know, something with two wheels and uh, pedals and chains yep. and steering. Yep. Yep. <clears throat> uh, that I, I won't go into detail, but um, I'd love to talk to you at, off camera about um, how I might go, what, what, what might be appropriate. Because um, I'm, it's one of those things I know a lot of guys who got in, have, have the most unlikely people to go cycling, and maybe cycling and mountain biking are different, but this the whole thing of getting on a one of those machines, getting out, clearing the head, you know, not sure about the lycra yet. <clears throat> that might be... you get that, used That to. might be... <laughs> <laughs> well, from what my your wife other, says... Your other persona. Yeah, that's... <laughs> <laughs> it might be just the release I'm looking for. <clears throat> well, from what my wife says about men yeah. walking around with their bike things, I think she, she'd love to see me and some. There's a lot of farmers <clears throat> up New England here. That's, that are mountain bikers. That's that's it. Cyclists. There, yeah, must be something, actually, there must be something in that. There's actually, yeah, I think, uh, and and I, yeah, there's more and more. And now, actually, uh, it's funny, but have been thinking the last couple of years that maybe the next bike on the farm won't be a combustion bike. It'll be an electric mountain bike because mm. the, the performance they're getting out of them is phenomenal. And, <clears throat> and I, and I, we don't, you know, we don't have a huge property. It's only six k's to the back fence, so mm. um, it, 
But there's yeah. some pretty st- you know, steep terrain, I imagine. Oh, I, I've, I've tried some of those mountain bikes, and the electric yeah. bikes, you can ride up stuff steeper than you can nearly walk up. It's yeah. phenomenal. So. Actually, we were, <coughs> we've just been doing some homework on... Um, electric bikes and they are much more like a i guess i you know to replace a, mo- a motorbike and they are the two wheel drive and apparently they're yeah fantastic. and they're only a couple yeah. of grand more than, yeah. than a, a sort of an equivalent yep. as you can even say an equivalent yeah well, electric side by sides you know we've we've just we upgraded a couple of years ago to a side by side rather than the, the, the diesel the, the quad bike no it's a pet it's oh, a petrol right. <coughs> petrol one yeah but, but it's um you know i think the 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 uh, potential for electric side by side, you know, yeah. all terrain vehicles well, like that. It's just that. a, and, it's just and, a and golf quiet. buggy, isn't it? <clears throat> and to be, and, and that's something I notice when I do go out on the mountain bike, just it's so nice to be able to hear everything. Yeah. Uh, it, it makes it harder when you want to, when a master a paddock, the sheep can't hear you coming. Unless but, you're checking <laughs> lambing news, isn't it? Yeah, but if you, if, but if you, you, you do hear, it's surprising what you do <laughs> hear um, when you're just on the mountain bike. So, mm. um, but yeah, my, my, Remy's actually uh, working as a bike mechanic, so we can talk about that later too. But he, he's, he's well and truly taken it up. <laughs> well, I need something that sort of like can handle gravel, rough bitumen, um, not speedway type stuff. Yeah, and I, need, I need to be able to carry a chainsaw. <clears throat> Um, oh, when you work out what you need to do to chainsaw <laughs> to, do, to do some lopping, needs to have the capacity. Yeah, an electric chainsaw. I hope. But, uh, I'm not sure about carrying a sheep either. That'd be challenging. On <laughs> You'll need to put a little. Um, I think the buggy is the, the way to go. The bu- yeah. <clears throat> um, we digress, um, but I will hit you up for some advice on I think because it's something I've just been not avoiding, but just going. Oh, I don't know. It's a little too hard. And do I get a second hand one? And because I borrowed a mate's one, it was like ten grand bike, and like. Wrote it for two k. When uh, if I break anything, I'm in I'm in big trouble. <laughs> so um, back to the farm um, uh, events, photography, um, children. Yep, children. When we started having children, uh, that was that was the clincher. Uh, Millie's from Paris, slightly different to the farm. Mm. Um, it was a you know. How pretty, many years ago? Pretty, just to put put it all under. Uh, Ninety seven. Yeah. You meant. And uh, so she'd just come over on exchange, but she does remember flying over Central Australia and looking down and going, I'm going to stay here. And uh, <laughs> Really? That's cool. <laughs> so her, <clears throat> her, father, her father actually spent time in Australia as a kid too. His, his father was uh, in, uh, in the government and had worked as a diplomat or something out mm-hmm. here in, uh, in agriculture, which is weird. Um, and uh, yeah, so she came over here, and yeah, that's that's a story for another time too. But yeah, eighteen months later, we were we were married, and mm. and uh, I'd I'd been on exchange over in Sweden as well, and and um, <clears throat> so yeah, we she was out working, I was still finishing uni, and we started having kids, and that was like we've got to get out of the city, and. Um, just uh, the space, and and by that time, Millie had had enough time to adjust to the, you know, the idea of moving out with a peasant sheep farmer. And uh, so, uh, so any earlier <laughs> might have, mightn't have been good. There, there, there was an adjustment earlier on. There it might have been harder. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. Look, um, I can't thank my parents enough. <laughs> they uh, they were a big attraction for Millie, but um, and you know they've they've uh, inspired. Um, myself and my sisters in so many ways too and in the choices we've made and um so I've I've, I've got one sister that's um back on on the property as well so she she took one one block and uh which is about 8k so the east of here and um and uh and I'm on the on the home block here I'm very lucky my yeah. other sisters said can we just save a little spot for her later on she's a occupational therapist in Newcastle but um they're up here all the time, and her partner's keen bird photographer these days. So cool. he's loving it here. We we've got you know over 120 species of bird wow. identified on the place. There's bird studies happening again at the moment. So who but, does the study? Are you get uni in to do it, or do you guys do it? Is um, it? The early studies were done by Nick Nick Reed. Um, he did a lot of the bird 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 stuff here, I think. But uh, they had students. That was part of the Land Water and Wool project back in. Um, uh, no, I, when was it? Two thousand and 
2002 or something that started. Uh, AWIN, Land Water Australia, big project, huge amount of data collected right across the country. Uh, our farm was one of the case study properties up here, along with Tim Wright and uh, Rob Dull Huntley, oh, cool. and um, and the New England uh, the, the the theme up here was uh, biodiversity on you know wool growing properties. Mm. Um, anyway, the, and what what were some of the results that sort of came out of that? I mean. It, what, what was some of the findings? Uh, the highlights? Well, they they well and truly, you know, demonstrated that that uh, you know promoting biodiversity is quite possible on you know wool growing properties, grazing properties, and um, and there was lots of solutions. As like I said, there's a huge amount of uh, huge amount of publications came out of that project. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of it sort of got archived, and we we still keep. A lot of it, and um, you mentioned and, one the other day. Well, there's a there's a another project uh, just started up now that uh, you know carbon accounting and, and carbon and biodiversity is a, is a, actually of an interest to the government and the market. Um, uh, with, there was actually a, a carbon sequestration study done on the property here in 1992. Wow! And uh, if you'd asked people what carbon sequestration was then they would have given you a very blank look and um yeah it's this sort of thing science fiction or something mm. but, but um but yeah we've still got that that was actually done on in some of the pine plantations which is which is probably why it was hidden away from its pines and exotic <laughs> what was what did they find oh they they it was it was a a, a destructive t- uh you know it was a full-on uh, d- digging up the trees, uh, measuring mm. how much carbon was in the, you know, being sequestered in the in the in the root systems and in the soils and and uh, um, and in the trees, they you know measured the whole lot and um, they did it. I, I I can't remember all the details, but I I point out I often just point out that and that was actually a Southern Cross Uni thing. So it's funny that Southern Cross Uni are now you know leading the way mm. um, in a lot of that. Soil testing and soil carbon testing, and that wind's getting a bit stronger, isn't it? Come, it must be coming around it a little. Is. It'll stop again. It's just gusting. Yeah. <clears throat> so yeah, so they, they it was a serious um, uh, assessment. Yeah. And what and what did they find? They thought that, like I said, I can't uh, off the top of my head. Yeah, <laughs> but, but but it wasn't like a standout. Oh my God, we've got to plant a whole more pine no, trees. No, no, but or maybe not an objective. No, it wasn't. It, the there wasn't a, a. They were purely looking at you know sequestered carbon yeah. and measuring yeah. measuring carbon, but not necessarily was, the change in. No, they weren't you know, looking at changes. No. They were. They were. But it's a lot of that. A lot of that information now has been used um, in the carbon modelling and the carbon yeah. accounting. So yeah. that was the the hard. Hard uh, data that they needed to, to say, well, you know, trees of this size, of this age, yeah. uh, this diameter, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you know, uh, contain this much carbon. Yeah, more and, of a and, more of a sort of a reference point. <laughs> that's right. So you were asking about the other project that's uh, happening right now. That's um, uh, AWI is collaborating with La Trobe University, and this has come out of a study done by, um, uh, well. Pushed by a Vanguard, and uh, that's Mark Gardner down oh, Dubbo, yeah. Yeah. and um, Sue Ogilvy, uh, she's from ANU, I think, and um, Rachel Lawrence up here, the UNE, and uh, and Danny O'Brien, mm-hmm. and they uh, they they were able to get fifteen farms with uh, grassing bogs woodlands, and they did extensive natural capital accounting on those properties, and uh, one of the big things that came out of that was um, was how much carbon is 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 um, you know in the in the tree component mm. of the ecosystems and um, that that's a really big thing for us because well you know that the, the woody debris on the ground and the trees growing it's there's that's that's carbon it's really it's in your face it's not like soil carbon which is out of sight and um, you know, there's still a lot of research going into h- how much, how long for, ha- you know, um, and um, etc. But uh, 
so yeah, that that's that that's been really exciting. And the, this new project, they've got fifty properties across the, um, I think mostly Eastern Australia, but um, they're obviously all wool growing properties, being an AWI sponsor. That's Australian Wool Innovation a sponsored project. Um, but yeah, again, um, so I think that they'll probably dig up a lot of the land, water, and wool data. Uh, and I know that yeah, a lot cool. of those properties. It's funny how it's the same same mm-hmm. properties. There's a there's a lot of new properties now now as well. But um, but yeah, there's there's quite a few people out there that have been doing these sort of things for a long time. And not probably yelling from the roof, <coughs> rooftops about it. It's just it just gets done and it just gets hopefully done. the research yep. or the the results. Uh, published and can be used, but as you say, quite yep. often, depending on who's running those sort of yep. things, you know, sometimes it's as much a, a box ticking exercise and just, you know, it's just like, okay, I've spent my money, you know, I'm not suggesting by any means what you've done here is, but you know, I, I just, my no, experience no, no, with no, we see with researchers yeah. is like, oh, cool, you know, I've got the funding, tick yep. the box, yep. it gets shelved, or, or you know, and then the right. job's done, or the results don't align with some, yep. you know, yep. No, no, paradigms no, it's, it, that, it's, you know. It's, it's harsh, but there is a lot of, um, you know, there's been a lot of tree plant planting done over the years that's, that has just ticked a box. Mm. Um, and uh, we've seen a lot of that across the tablelands. You see, you know, very fragmented little bits of tree planting here and there. But um, no, my parents have uh, well and truly exceeded that. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and that's clear when you look. You know, you look on Google Earth, Google Maps, and and there's a big green triangle in the middle of the tablelands, and uh, that's you guys. And that's <laughs> it does stand out. I just want to get back to that before we do uh, before we leave carbon or sort. Of, are you are you be looking the soil carbon sort of market that whole industry scenario commodity? Uh, yes, and we've uh, we haven't. Signed ourselves up to anything. We've we've uh, we've had um, audits done and proposals put to us, but uh, the the idea of putting a, a covenant on you know areas of the property uh, that are going to affect future generations, um, we decided against going down that path. And I've spoken to a lot of farmers too that are balked at that point. I think um, the look. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to have trouble articulating all this, but uh, <laughs> um, from what I've been, what I've learnt, and what I've been told uh, by people that know I'm much better, um, you know, any any carbon you're sequestering away is 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 you know potential that's not not being accessed. So you do have to consider that there is a possibility we could turn this into a you know massive carbon bank, just plant the whole thing, and um, but we're still going to be making more money out of grazing. And, um, at, you know, if the carbon price changes and, you know, biodiversity credits change and the markets pick up like mm. they have overseas, um, you know, that, that, that might be very different. But at this stage, we're, we're trying to keep an open mind to it all and trying not to tie ourselves down with you know something that's going to affect future generations, so that I guess affecting future generations um, and covenants mm. that would apply more to um, like a, a conservation um, uh, kind of um, covenant on on biodiversity, like on a on a stand of, um, and, and, of trees and, and like agreements on you know how much soil carbon. Uh, look, I'm, and soil carbon, yeah, and so and you know. So, uh, there's a lot of people uh, pretty positive about, uh, pretty pretty definite about yeah. how much carbon can be sequestered in soils. Yeah. But um, uh, look, there's a lot of very good soil scientists around just locally and, and I haven't seen any convincing evidence yet that it's a quick buck. <laughs> well, it could be a quick buck, but it could be, I guess. And, the... and it could be a quick way to lose the money again, yeah. you know, 20 years down the track. So I'd, I'd prefer to be... Be put be putting that money, uh, you know, putting that into trees, yeah, and, and putting my time and, um, and and look, you know, there's a lot of the, lot of the biodiversity and you know, uh, vegetation type proposals, carbon uh, sequestration proposals, uh, are, are also all native, and uh, as you 
no, we're not all native here. <laughs> I'd say you're you're the majority of non-native, which <laughs> look, I'm really pleased to say. Look, be honest, look to be we 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 plant a lot of natives as mm. well. This mm. year's planting is two thirds natives and yeah. uh, one third exotics. Um, so we do plant a lot of natives as well, mm. and we're n- at a point now where we're getting natural regeneration of our natives. So yeah, cool. So that's that's really exciting. That's something we've just started to really noticed in the last 10 years, 10, 10 15 years. Um, you think that's due to, um, in those areas where it's regenerating, is, is that due to stock exclusion? Is it due to um, grazing management or both? Or bit, bit of both, bit of both. Um, I think, look, grazing management's probably been the main one. We've been able to, uh, during my dad's time on the farm, did a lot of fencing up of the place. Uh, and I've done a lot of. Um, going to chase, going to chase you again. There. <laughs> He's getting very about to, this bloke. He'll, must, be like, he'll be like horizontal in a minute. No, no, no. You, you, must, you, you sit however's comfortable. I'll, I'll chase ba- you. Backrest sag. <laughs> This old chair. Um, there we go. The yeah. office chairs outside. They're That's not right. handy. They don't know what to do out here. <laughs> the um, yeah. The where was I? You were. Um, oh, where were we? We were. We were <laughs> the na- the natives. Oh yeah, um, uh, and 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 natural regen. Yes. So, yeah. Look, it's, grazing. Uh, yeah, I think probably more grazing. Uh, for mm. a start, we might have said I oh, was, you know, and a lot of people will still say it's because we're not spreading uh, excessive amounts of fertilizer now, but we are spreading a lot of, you know, trip manure, and we are still getting regen in those areas. So uh, I don't think it's input related. I think it's more to do with the grazing management, but it's been the grazing management in and around the two last droughts that we've had, which have been major uh, germination uh, mm. points in history. At the at the end of those dry periods? At the, yeah. at, at, at the end of those dry yeah. periods or, or, or may, possibly even during if the, you know, if the little showers have fallen at the right point. Mm. Um, and look, there's still a lot being learned about, you know, native seed germination and fields... <laughs> Fields in in uh, fields in bio solutions in Urala here. I've got a PhD student doing a lot of that there. Steve and, and uh, Steve Fields and Dave Carr are up in Darwin at the moment at a big conservation conference, and they've been presenting a lot of that uh, that that uh, information up there. Andrew Gardner spoke yesterday at our Silver Pasture webinar and 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 touched on a lot of that. And it's it, there's still so much to be learnt and. Quickly going back to the pines, a lot of people ask, you know, why why were we, we, we planting pines? When we started, there was only um, there was a, mainly only pine nurseries. There was not there was a, there was a lot of other exotics being propagated too because they were easy, but pines were being propagated on a large scale at that time. Not many people were growing eucalypts um, or any any natives. Um, and, and the difference was fifteen cents a seeding seedling compared to you know five or six dollars a seedling, and if you're putting in ten twenty thousand trees a year, it's it's a big difference in mm. <laughs> in price. So um, that's why we, you know that's why we're planting pines. There was also the potential of, for, for timber, and um, but initially it was for shelter and shade and shelter for the stock. You know there was New England dieback; it really hammered the tablelands. But uh, you know now we now know that it was it was the graziers that were hammering the tablelands and and nature was responding. Um, do you think it was uh, grazing? Do you think it's because uh, I also hear um, you know super, the use of super phosphate? They just curl their toes up because that's just more phosphorus than they can handle. Is that another? Uh, there's definitely look. I, I believe there are definitely species that uh, do struggle with high phosphorus levels. Yes, um, but. I, I don't know, uh, the, the, you know. Like I said, we're still seeing regeneration in paddocks that are that are getting the inputs. So, um, yeah, maybe maybe it was the excessive amounts of phosphorus. Um, yeah, look, I, I I'm, I'm neutral on that one. Mm. But um, but the point is, we're getting the you know we're getting the results that we we wanted, and we think we're mainly getting that through grazing management, longer rest periods, and um yeah so um uh, yeah what, what are you what are you planting <laughs> um you said sort of a third 
exotics, two thirds natives, um, with the um, exotic portion of that, or any other year, what what, what are some of your? Um, well, I guess the, you could have some favourite trees, and you can have some <laughs> just trees that aren't necessarily your favourite, but you just didn't know they're doing a job. And then also, what 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 job are you trying to get them to do? Uh, well, like, like I said initially, shade and shelter was for front, front foremost. Um, timber is now a thing. Uh, you know, we've got a sawmill. We've been peeling logs for ten, fifty, uh, for twenty years now. Mm. The Lucas Mill, have you? Uh, no, it's Mahoey Mill, actually. Is it really? Where it's from? A, it's a Kiwi mill. Yeah. Um, my father found that one through his research. He's always been very good with his research on these things. It's a uh, very similar in size to a to a Lucas Mill, but it's got a twin blade, oh. and uh, we've found we can we can get a lot more production. Out of it in a day, so it's, so it's you like can you, just get through more logs. You can well, you you when you've uh, when you've when you've squared off the top of your log and you've squared off a side, then obviously every cut after that, you're taking a board out each time on each row. Yeah. So uh, and then you drop down and you square off the side, and then you you're taking a board out. It's it's cable driven from one end. I'm using lots of hand actions here, but. Yeah. <laughs> you can't. You can't. Oh, our listeners you are very can't hear them. <laughs> it's cable driven from one one end, so it's very safe. You're not walking along next to the saw. You, you. Yeah, it's a cool. uh, little gate brings the board back to you. So it's we we were we got up to eight you know cubic meters of sawn sawn rough sawn timber a day, and that's that's pretty good for a for a portable mill. Um, and what what's the na- what do you what's the name of it? Uh, Mahoey, M A. M A H O E. Cool, and there and it's yeah, big tur- turbo diesel engine. Yeah, nice. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so yeah, so so sorry, I'm, I'm just I'm fascinated. <laughs> I haven't got one. I <laughs> nearly bought one about 15 years ago because I was out there. No, it'd be bloody 20 years ago now. Because I when I got back from uh, oh uni working in pubs, I would go and find freshly sawn um, uh, native timber. Yep. So it's, sorry, f- freshly fallen, yep. and bash the with the the, the butt of the axe, b- bash the the bark off to yep. let it dry, yep. and then I yep. sent some into town <laughs> yep. to Stonehaven Furniture to get milled, yep. uh, and it, some came back, some got lost in there somewhere, probably still there. <laughs> um, so I've always um, had a really in- real um, real interest in it. So what sort of diameter can you put through it? Um, I, I, Whatever you can carry into the really, <laughs> yeah, it'll yeah. go up to. Uh, well, it sits on the ground and sort of just. Yeah, we've got we've got a we've got a bench we've got a bench that the the logs sit in on. Yeah. Um, so we chalk them on that. So it's a as okay. I said, you'd call that your saw bench and and uh, and this and the saw runs up and up and back on a on a big uh, a triangular beam. Yeah. Uh, so it's very, it's a very stiff, stable, stiff, yeah. stable, stiff beam. Do you take it out to the paddock where the timber is? <clears throat> no, we actually. Uh, yeah, look, the eighties drought was a big one for my dad. Uh, that's when he started supplementary feeding, and that's when they had. That was the last time they'd had really big dust storms yeah. from a drought. Um, that was definitely a big changing, you know, changing point for my father and in a lot of the. And my mother in in, in the uh, tree planting um, definitely prompted them to we're gonna we're gonna change this. This is not this is just not working. And uh, like I said, you know what my dad had grown up with had been a lot more bush. You know, saying earlier that my my grandmother used to walk walk my dad and his siblings to the bus. It's two k's to the bus down there um, in the shade of trees the whole way. And uh, you drive up our driveway. Uh, uh, you come through a couple of neighbouring properties, but uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't do that now. You wouldn't have a chance. So and, and what the, my dad had seen as a kid and grown up with was was in that very short time. That's right, leave it there. It's going to be right. Hasn't turned it off. It's the main thing. And uh, so you, you, you could go. And um, yeah, in the seventies, sixties, seventies, there was just a, such a dramatic change. In the landscape, that um, anyway, so they got 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 going on the on the tree planting, uh, and I've got off track again. No, no, it's all right. No, so yeah, no eighties, <laughs> um, dust storms, trees in the shade. How did those ones? What happened to those ones over that in that period of time from when your father was 
was a boy walking to the bus? Like, were they? Did they just die from dieback? Did they, they end of their lives? What? Because there like, there's was, a lot of there's yeah. two k's of no shade now. Well, yeah, there's there, some shade. But. There was no. Uh, I think most of the clearing had stopped. There was yeah. still a hell of a lot of pushing up the dead wood on the ground and burning it, and um, that's something my dad and mum realised that that was you know just. My dad thinks back to all the time he spent on the tractor pushing up, pushing up, yeah. pushing up wood and, mm-hmm. and burning it and just cannot believe, <laughs> thought he was doing the right thing, mm. fighting up the paddocks. But, um, but uh, yeah, just so much carbon just up in smoke. Mm. Could have been back in the soil. Could mm. have been, uh, I think they, they, they talk about often uh, one winter they were planting trees on, on, a, on the... Um, Tablelands, very the open plains between Urala and Armadale. There, there's a there's an area, and they they uh, it was a very cold, windy winter's day, and uh, there was a, a stand of dead um, stags, and uh, every time they went past, they were they were planting trees, so that was that was good, mm. but uh, but they noticed every time they went past this stand of uh, you know a few dead stags, the drop in the wind was noticeable. And uh, and that was just from a few old dead trees. Mm. <laughs> and it was enough, but it was a, you know just another Good of those learning. little observations that you go, oh, actually that dead trees. Yeah. And then again, I, I got some great photos during the last two droughts. I'm talking the thirteen fourteen drought and the two thousand nineteen drought. Um, great photos of of stock standing in the shade of dead trees, uh, and because that was the only shelter they had in paddocks. Um, so mm. that that uh, really, you know, highlights uh, the 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 need for. And I and look, I think um, I think you know, shade and shelter in terms of production, it's it's, it's all the data's there now. People, you know, people call me now and then, going, you know, I'm just losing, I'm losing too many stock during winter and, and, and lambs and lambing, and mm. I need shelter. And uh, what do I do? Where do I go? And um, so we we do actually we've got the Agri Woodland Network up here under the Landcare branch, and so a bunch of mentors that are that have uh, done Rowan Reed's Master Tree Grower course and, and a mentoring course, mm. and um, um, so there there is a network there now across the region that um, is helping helping people still, but it's yeah it's still phenomenal that we went through that 2019 drought. I I don't know whether anybody else noticed. All the dust flying past, but it was um, it was very different here on the on the farm. You know that yeah. that look honestly, the pastures even here were were very depleted. We still had you know close to one hundred percent ground cover. It was all very well, very dead, but we weren't getting the dust lifting. Mm. But if we didn't have the shelter of the trees, we would have had yeah, we would have had stuff blowing. So mm. um, yes, yeah, you can't. You can't. Sometimes those droughts are severe, so severe that that the pastures will just dry out yeah. and die. Yeah, and blow away. Um, look, the natives will hang in. I was just blown away by. You know, we get our half a mil of rain, be, be dancing around, jumping for joy, half a mil and uh, or a mil mm. sometimes a big downpour, two mil, mm. and um, and uh, and most most people were well. You know, what's the point? It's just evaporating again, yeah. but. Actually, if it's if there's something there to grow, it, the grass grows, and then it's, and the natives just yeah, I couldn't believe seeing green grass, mm. you know, growing when it was just so so dry, and uh, you know two two twenty two twenty mils for the year that year. It's this is a normally a seven hundred mil rainfall. Yeah, wow. We know average doesn't exist. Yeah. Um, What's, what's it's that? only a reference. It sums up a reference, but <laughs> it, it, there, average, there was average significant human is definite. A, yeah. Average human is one breast and one testicle. <laughs> That's a Jim Garrish thing. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've heard that one. So <laughs> I love that one. <laughs> so yeah, let's so we, not be we, average. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, but yeah, look, it was it was uh, to see that extreme and see how um, the natives handled that. Was, yeah, was. You know, it's inspired me to plant a few more natives, keep planting a few more natives, yeah. but at the same time, some of our exotics handled that dry really well. Like, we also like, saw a like lot what? of exotics. Um, you know, I'm very uh, very partial to my oaks. Mm. 
my parents discovered uh, the Oak family. But yeah, they they actually discovered it. No, they didn't discover it. They didn't. I was, discover gonna, it. I was they, thinking, gee, they must be like twenty thousand years old. <laughs> no, they didn't well, discover it. But they 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 realised the oaks were there was a lot more to the oak family than they than they had originally seen in the few oaks that were mm. kicking around in old gardens. There's a there's a couple of hundred plus year old oaks. Uh, actually, there's a row of elm trees down that you would have driven through. Mm. Um, I used to say, oh, those elms, they're, they're nearly 100, 100 years old. They're probably over 100 years. And then I only found out a couple of years ago that they're over 180 years old. Get out of here. And uh, I had the privilege of milling up one that recently that was blown over in a storm, but there's still a pretty good grove down there. Those those elms have long, lived a long while. Yeah, big fan of elms too. So, so what, the so one you milled, oaks, how was the timber? It was, oh, stunning. Yeah. Elm, elm is uh, mm. difficult uh, in timber terms, it dries very unevenly. Yeah. So it needs to be well seasoned, but seasoned before we can use it. But uh, I can assure you, everyone, all the tailors have uh, have said that. Yes, they want a bit. <laughs> so when you say just to, on that one technical point, so when you say so seasoned, are you saying dried. seasoned? Yeah, dried prior to milling or dried post milling? Dried pro- post milling. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you, it needs to be uh, – so generally if you quarter saw the, the more valuable timbers, they're not going to uh, crack. You don't get the cracks as much. The the, the radial uh, the radial um, shrinkage is yeah. greater than the tangential. So, uh, um, so that depends yeah. on – the the grain and the is it yes. a bit of a bit of a bit of a calculation or a bit of a thing to consider yep. there about your cuts and then, yes yeah yep. okay yep. good one yep. so we can we, we the the mahoe is not ideal for it but we can uh, we can quite easily quarter saw a, a log so mm. so uh, yeah back to to oaks oaks are also a very long lived family of trees. Yeah. Um, oaks are the uh, the quirkiest families like the equivalent of our eucalypt family. Um, There's a lot there, isn't it? Quercus are northern hemisphere only, but quercus uh, grow in, you know, oaks grow in all sorts of climates from high deserts to to tropical areas. So uh, there's a huge, you know, know, five, six hundred plus species and many, many hybrids um, in the oak family, similar to the eucalypts. You gave me a bag of your hybrids a couple of years ago. Maybe ten bucks is only for them. Yeah, and you said some of them ten. even germinated. And oh no, survived. they definitely germinate. And I think, yeah. as I was saying yeah. the other day, I put them in in April, which was only a month. Oh, something. How long ago we? You gave me those things. Anyway, I'm Copy. pretty sure they're the ones yeah. that I put in April. They were out by May. Yeah. And they, <laughs> if um, they were out by May here, they'd be frosted. <laughs> would they? Well, they, well, these ones were. They had little guards, like yeah. little little yep. rizos on yep. them, core yep. fluid things. Yep. Anyway, um, <clears throat> and as I was saying the other day. Back in the summer, mm. no, it might have been bloody January, February, they got flogged because some cattle got in there. Yeah. But um, they performed very well. So, yeah, so very many, many, many different varieties and yep. hybrids. And yeah, look, uh, deciduous as well. So um, a, lo- a lot of them, uh, not all of them, there's a huge number of uh, evergreen oaks too. Do you, do you plant them, evergreens? Yeah, we, we, we plant, we've collected over 90 odd species of, of mm. uh, Quercus and uh, we know that there's about 75 definitely the last count there was the 75 that had survived for, for more than 10 15 years and, um, and we got some, you know we've got a lot now that are you know, pushing 30 40 years and, mm. and then there's the old you know the old ones in my grandparents garden and some of my cousins are in some of the older houses and and there's the very old oaks mm. Um so yeah, look, there's a there's there's also there was a potential for for timber in the oaks too, but like I said, it it was it's it's always been about diversity and trying things. It just happened that the oak family had a lot of diversity within it. They are very easy to propagate, as you know, the yeah. ac- acorns are a big live seed. It's really easy to see them, even if I lose my one of my eyesight, should still be able to um, pick up an oak acorn, mm. and. Um, yeah, they uh, uh, like I said, the, with the diversity, we've been able to try lots of different ones, and and we're finding the ones that survive quite well here. And timber, you know, the potential again, uh, as in the eucalypts, um, there's a lot of valuable timber 
um, species um, and and in the oaks as well. So my parents walk around the property now just totally blown away by the fact that they're looking at acorns that they planted, oaks that they planted, and they're, they're already pushing 30, 40 centimetres in diameter, and that's, that's only in, in 35, 40 years. It's just... Um, Mm. They're not, you know, I, I say that because a lot of people think oaks, they think slow growing. Um, oaks are often seen as slow growing because they spend a lot of time uh, uh, establishing their root systems. It's a it's a five to one ratio, I'm told, five five below the ground to, to one above, um, which is hard to believe when you see the size of some of the oaks. But, mm. um, but yeah, so that's that's a huge amount of root system below the ground. And funny enough, roots are made out of no, carbon. carbon. Something too. called carbon. Looking for more information to assist your regenerative journey? Come join Charlie and his guests around the kitchen table an online community of supporters with exclusive access to the Regenerative Journey interview transcripts, live online Q&A sessions, a chance to engage with other like-minded people and more. Go to www.charliearnett.com.au forward slash the kitchen table and we look forward to sharing a yarn with you. Now let's get back to this week's episode. What do you see them, Oaks, specifically or generally um, general exotic trees contributing to the the landscape? Well, again, we, we live in such a modified landscape, don't we? We've, we've uh, um, not, uh, we haven't necessarily gone out to damage the landscape, but in some cases we have and uh, but we live in a in a landscape where we're, we're, we're running exotic animals, sheep, cattle, chickens, um, and uh, growing exotic crops, uh, wheat, oats, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I guess and, we're um, exotic here too. Aren't we're we? pretty exotic here too. Yeah. And like I said, we've. Uh, I mean, you have a French wife, so she's even more, <laughs> even more exotic. contributing to the exoticness. Yeah, hybrid vigor. The exotic nization of the landscape. <laughs> <laughs> so look, yeah, it's, uh, I, I don't. I think uh, in agricultural landscapes that you're you're dreaming a little bit if you think you can get back to what was there before uh now we're facing climate change and now um as as nick reed presented yesterday uh all the all the modeling showing um that the how regions are going to change and and potentially you know wipe out uh native species that are very adapted to some areas um other species will adapt and move uh, and uh, but in the meantime we we have to be Thinking diversity and and climate resilience and and just seasonal resilience. I mean, like I said, I've been through two droughts now. That the first one, thirteen fourteen, was I was like, oh, it's you know, it hasn't been this bad. It's never been this bad. Um, so, you know, that water hole hasn't dried up since sixty four, and this is probably worse than the centenary federation drought, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then. We got through that, and we we're like, right, ready. We can we can handle this. And I'm, mm. uh, and I said, you know, never again hand feeding. I don't want to do that. So I've been concentrating on on uh, on the pastures and um, getting the getting that right, getting the nutrition in there, and and managing them better. And um, and at the same time, you know, observing how the weeds have come in and. Managing those too, and then and everybody's seen the same coming out, and then and then 2019 arrived, and uh, wow, <laughs> Just, yeah, yeah, <laughs> forget 2013. <laughs> so yeah, and, and and I'm sure I'm sure plenty of people heard heard farmers go, oh, the pandemic was nothing. <laughs> 2019, on the other hand, you mm. know, water is yeah. challenging. You, water is uh, is pretty essential to life, and. And when you when you're on eighteen hundred acres and and you haven't got a drop of water, it's uh, it starts to get pretty scary. Yeah. So, um, um, yeah. So the trees the trees, the trees in that scenario were were were, 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 perf- were sort of had a function. They had a huge function. They but they were my fallback. I knew I knew already that if I'd had to sell all my stock or or reduce my stock, 
I had a had an on-farm business in the timber already. Um, look, we honestly we don't do a whole lot of milling uh, at the moment. We're doing we do we do custom orders and that sort of thing, but uh, the the profits we're making aren't like what we're making out of it, sheep and cattle and the wool. So, um, and that's that's just how it is. We're not in a we're not in a big forestry area. We're very we're, we're very remote here. Um, you know, southeast Queensland or, or out on the eastern slopes um, are my nearest timber industries, and they're they're quite a long way. And the biggest markets are still Brisbane, Sydney. Um, so when we were when we were selling a lot of timber, we we were you know the Brisbane markets were taking as much as they could get. That was great. That was good to know. And yeah. and um, and now the news, you know, the forestry industry is facing a massive deficit of softwood um and there's a huge amount lost in the fires mm. um and yeah they reckon the next 15 years is going to be very interesting so you know, who knows maybe the maybe the timber will be worth a bit more if we if we have another drought in the meantime the next drought will be just around the corner we know yeah. that now um but yeah having those trees there being able to to go into a forest of and stand in you know ankle deep green microlina was uh was pretty special um, in the drought under those trees in the drought under those trees in in a pine forest mind you yeah okay. in a pine forest and look i've got plenty of photos um of, of that it was just it was amazing and um huge relief and and again like i said the dust we just weren't getting the the dust lifting off the ground here we weren't getting you know, it only takes five or ten k's to drop that wind speed, and and makes a hell of a difference. Um, the bird life here was phenomenal. I think a lot of birds were moving in from. <laughs> yeah. Um, like kangaroos. And, and yeah, look, my my dad grew up. It was a novelty for him to see kangaroos, and now we're a little bit overrun by <laughs> kangaroos wallabies. We do have, we do have a roo harvester coming in regularly and, um, and mm. harvesting roos. Yeah. Um, yeah, roos, wallabies, wallaroos, um, but it's great. It's really nice to to see those things too, and and we seem to be living along with them. Mm. What about uh, um, nutrient cycling? Do you, do you get a sense of what those deciduous trees are doing as a nutrient sink or not? Yeah, look, I think uh, we've we've seen um, areas of pretty pretty average pasture planted out to trees because you know they were areas that we we could afford to. Say well, we, let's let's plant this down to trees, and now you go into those areas, and and the amount of uh, litter on the ground, and the and the colour of the soil, and and um, we just had uh, Znet Nirala here have been doing biodiversity and soil study on on properties around the place. Znet's the uh, zero net emissions for um, for Nirala, and uh, they've been extending their reach out into to the rural onto properties. And um, yeah, we had some soil tests done on the tree fest site, which was uh, tree fest was a, a little field day we hosted here, and my parents dreamt up tree um, fest, cool. In '92, uh, and uh, yeah, look, uh, we had uh, they it, it actually grew into something so big. It was just around the time of um, uh, formation of land care, and they were looking for projects and. So this little field, they thought they'd run this little field day on 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 tree planting technique and propagation and etc. And they had, yeah, they ended up postponing it a year, not because of a pandemic, but because uh, it was growing into something much much bigger. Uh, there was a real thirst for for mm. information, and uh, yeah, so it turned into this big day. They had a big day, lots of demonstrations, ten hectares all planted down to trees in demonstrations that day, lots of different. Um, planting planting uh, seed, you know, direct seeders and planters, you know, a few different planting machines that my dad had designed and built. Um, but we, we had, had uh, just under 100 exhibitors from all over the country. Um, they they ran a big marquee. They had speakers all day. So the head of Lancaster Australia was here and we had all the pollies at, at lunchtime. They'd counted 6,000 people through the gate. And this is um, in ninety ninety two ninety two yeah six thousand people through the gate yeah wow yeah and they and that was it here and it was yeah it was here it was here six thousand and people. it was it was another two k's up you know out on the farm so 
I had a fair way to drive in, and mm. and it wasn't even a it wasn't even a Facebook event. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, internet didn't exist. Exist, no, ninety two. So um, have, you yeah. done, have you done it since? Uh, we had a twenty year reunion event here uh, when we planted a. Uh, um, so uh, Sarah Schmuder and guys in Armadale, Beck Smith, uh, had a had an event called Frog Dreaming. Yeah, they were running for kids, mm. and um, they were looking for a new location and known Sarah for a while, and she wanted. To, uh, so we yeah we 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 got the opportunity to host that. We ended up hosting Frog Dreaming for four years, and um, but the first year of that uh, was coincided with the twenty year anniversary of. Tree fest, so uh, I had a crazy idea. I always wanted to plant something that could be seen. Google Google Earth was a was was a thing then, and mm. uh, Google. So you were starting to see aerial maps, and thought it wouldn't it be cool to have you know big tree planting. And like I said, our place already stood out this, this big green triangle. But uh, wouldn't it be cool to have a you know writing or big shape or something? So we came up with the idea of a big forest in the shape of a frog. Mm. And um, and yeah, you can look, look, you can zoom in on the property now and see a big forest see in the, the shape of a frog. But all the kids uh, got involved in in that, and they planted a, a few trees. We limited them to just a few trees each because uh, spend a lot of time replanting <laughs> trees that have been put in upside down, <laughs> upside down or yes. on their side or yeah. half in. Or I've um, had some experience. But it, but it's something now. I hope I'm I'm hoping the kids that were involved in that. Look back now, mm-hmm. and they zoom in on their on their smartphone, yeah, and they can see cool. the frog that they planted. But Show their buddies. but we had a lot of people get together. Um, some of the old exhibitors, Dave Curtis, came and um, from uh, what's his, uh, he does a lot of um, theatre and uh, and uh, writing and arts in eco um, in conservation mm. and stuff. So he's he's worked a lot with Dave Carr as well. And um, yeah, so he came, and uh, yeah, we planted a big frog. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we did. Ha- we did That's have, a, but it was nothing like you know. We only had a f- had a few hundred people for that. And yeah, I don't think you'll never you'll ever see another six thousand people field yeah. day. Um, That's enormous. The, the internet has changed you, the way we access information. Well, yeah, so I guess, much. I guess so, <laughs> so, so much. You don't have to go to a pool day to get any stuff. No, you just anymore. listen to Charlie's podcasts. And That's it. And once we <laughs> once we put yours up there, it's, uh, no, you'll never see anyone here ever, ever again. I know it already. <laughs> Thank um, goodness. <laughs> but having saying having said that, though, I'd love to know when you're if you do ever do something like that again, because that'd be fantastic. And and not uh, and and given I I haven't. And probably won't have time to look around today. Um, love to come back. And this is, I'm not priming up for the end of the show either. <laughs> the thing. Just, we've got a little bit to go if you have got the time. You want another coffee? <laughs> no. <laughs> you know what I did this morning? I, I, I interviewed um, uh, um, Stu Austin. And for the first time in any interview I've ever done, I had to go and, had to go and drain the spuds halfway through. <laughs> I said, mate, you just sit here and I'll cut this bit out. Stuart was twiddling his thumb. He was. Yeah, I could hear him clicking away there, probably <laughs> checking we, emails or something. Yeah, we had Stuart here a couple of years ago and uh, that was great. It was, uh, um, uh, I, I, I apologise. I'm I'm always a little bit sceptical about <laughs> about some things, but Stuart actually uh, really made my dad's ears prick up. And, um, in regard to what are you talking about? Yeah, in, to, in regard to water, uh, water actually, we uh, we didn't have any water at that point. The mm. creek had been dry for a good good uh, year already, and um, so Stuart, um, I, I can't remember. I think Stuart was was uh, he he was observant enough to know which way the creek flowed. But at that point, we had a lot of we did have a lot of people seeing the creek and going. So which way does this creek flow? Mm. <laughs> But um, but yeah, Stuart actually uh, yeah, and, and some of the natural sequence farming ideas, um, uh, yeah, a lot of the observation stuff. Yes, you know there were things that my dad had definitely seen, but it gave us the confidence to start actually fiddling a little bit more with um, with some of the uh, areas that had that had suffered from erosion mm. uh, due to the overdevelopment previously. And uh, and our creek line was quite 
quite eroded and scarred deep. So already, you know, our creek's been fenced up for over 25 years now, I'd say. So we had, we've got, you know, big forests along our creek, very well protected riparian zone, but still the scars of mm. uh, of what had been there previously. So, so we're 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 now fiddling a little bit more, looking at uh, where the water flows and and trying to slow it down a little bit more because we think um, some of the creek flats probably have. Um, not uh, you know not holding the water that they could. Mm. Um, I had a had a, in the 2014 drought. I had a had a big water hole, big quite a big water hole, a good 300, 300 meters long, uh, you know, meter two deep, meter and a half deep probably, which is not so deep. But that was my backup plan when the dam, uh, a few hundred meters up off the creek, when that dam dried up, that was my backup plan. Was that water hole in the creek? The dam dried up, and uh, but the creek had been dry probably for <laughs> f- a few months before mm. that, and um, so that backup plan was uh, yeah it wasn't there. And but I we we are now looking at the way the our you know riparian zones possibly could hold more water. Um, um, we don't uh, we don't have bores on the place here, and we don't re- you know we're on the top of the range here, so mm. the only place water is going to come from is from here. <laughs> it's from upstairs, so from 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 up above us. But uh, so yeah, holding more water in the landscape is now our current you know um, yeah. little side projects. So. And 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 with the use with the intention of the intentional use <clears throat> of natural seconds farming. Um, uh, strategies? Uh, not, not, not exactly. Yeah. No, just some of the observations. Look, yeah. um, we're, we're, we still believe up here. Um, it was uh, oh my god, he's uh, Ron Watkins in WA. He was uh, one of the very early adopters of PA Yeoman's ideas, you know, contour lines and plantings, and and um, Ron Watkins is uh, is very well known over it. Ron Watkins actually spoke at Tree Fest in '92. Came mm-hmm. all the way from WA to speak, and uh, but you don't hear a whole lot about him these days. But yeah, he was well ahead of. Uh, but uh, look, we so we did actually, and Ron spent a lot of time here. On the, and they looked at putting in contour banks, but our decided our soils are uh, not exactly suited to to contours to a banks, you know, structure, and in the end, um, ground cover, I think, is trumped, mm. um, and all of that, and, and plus it's not a bump that we need to trip over on. <laughs> Right through the pay. I know. I, I would know the contour banks are yeah. very small. Yeah, and, well, and, a, and subtle. But, I would um, challenge you, Michael, to. Not, it's not a challenge. It's just a, we, we did a, and I, I'm thinking I was very, I was very similar, and I, and this is not. Uh, this is just my had been my experience. Yeah. Um, looked and read the books and and you know Peter Andrews stuff and yeah. and thought oh bloody mechanical stuff you know dozers or yeah. or or, yeah. or excavators and mechanical <laughs> stuff and diesel and whatever else. Yeah. Anyway, I sat on that for years and then for whatever reason thought you know what I need to look at this a bit more and I just sort of got a bit curious about it and then we ran a natural seconds farming course at. Had him in back in February with Stuart Andrews and Town Park Training. Yep, <laughs> Peter was there for a day. And I tell you what, it, it it I was really surprised at how much it changed my view yes. in four days of yep. of the lens through which I look at the landscape and yep. and my appreciation of the hydrology and and water flow. Definitely, it was yeah. a really interesting sort of <laughs> yep. uh, paradigm. Not that I had a huge paradigm about it or against it. It was just yep. it, it sort of restructured. Yeah my thinking in a really positive way. That's right. No, definitely. Look, you know, Stuart was only here for a day and and uh, um, I haven't met haven't met Peter, but I, I, I think it's awesome the stuff that they're doing and, and they and the but a lot of the observational stuff that comes with what they're doing is mm. is is the biggest part and I think mm. um, a lot of farmers would recognise that good anyway. observation skills yeah. are that would be, I, it, we, you know, we we have a lot of people come through here and, and you know, ask, so what's the number one skill as a farmer? And it's just observation, actually. Mm, mm. So um, if you're good at observing how things how things work and what's happening and whether it's your stock health or whether it's the pasture health or, or water or, 
or the climate, you know, we, we, you, you get to know when the rain's coming and you and uh, when there's going to be a frost. And, uh, um, so and it's free too, isn't it? It's free. Open your eyes. Just on that observational stuff, um, just, I'm just going back to a question that was in my head a little earlier, and the drought and the and the more I guess maybe more the natives because they're native as opposed to exotics. When do you see the trees behave in a certain way before or uh, I mean after after rain? I guess there might be some activity, but you know, yeah. do, you, do you see them being preemptive about uh, about, about rainfall yes. events or yes. yeah dry? yeah we we definitely do. And you know, like in a season like we've just had uh, a lot of the some of the oaks, anyway, not all of them, but some of them, the the acorns are germinating on the trees, and uh, uh, and, and they're like, yeah, like, hang on, we're not we're not in winter yet, guys. <laughs> I haven't even fallen off the tree, but they're germinating. I don't know whether that's, yeah, I I don't know. I I wouldn't. Mm, and when you I, say, I would say there's definitely some preemptive stuff, but there's definitely reactional stuff as well, and and seeing, observing, observing those reactions, uh, yeah. Preemptive. It's harder to spot the preemptive stuff. I think um, I, I know a lot of the plants still get quite confused. We'll have a mm. hot, we'll have a hot spell, and everything comes. And you know that they must be confused because they've all shit. They've all sh- shot. Shot. Yeah, there's shoots everywhere. There's flowers, and and then yep. and then wham, we're, we're another minus five frost. And, hey, did and you uh, get that <laughs> that this autumn? Has that happened this autumn? Uh, we, we, we've, uh, yeah, d- definitely a lot of the oaks, uh, a lo- sorry, a lot of the trees, full stop, uh, all, all types, uh, even some of the ukes, uh, were frosted off. Uh, we had some, we had some minus fives here, uh, very early and uh, it was unusual to see a lot of the, a lot of the deciduous exotics that, uh, normally, you know, colouring up beautifully and they've actually just been frosted. Oh, yeah, right. Before they even coloured up, because they had a fresh, they had a bit of fresh. Shoot well, they were still a bit green. Cooked. They was just yeah. still green. And, yeah, right. Uh, um, so yeah, I, 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 I won't go as far as you know thinking plants are, are well ahead of it. Uh, yeah. I think there's a more reactive stuff. Like yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm not, I'm not the expert on that. But yeah. but it, but again, it's still seeing how they react to mm. to different seasons and. And uh, definitely uh, the oaks, you know, again, the d- deciduous species are capable of dropping all their leaves. And, and in 2019, you know, by, by February, <laughs> January, February, we, a lot of the exotics were already, the deciduous ones were, you know, were colouring up, dropping their leaves or just dropping their leaves. Yeah. And uh, they were like, no, nope, it's, I'm gonna shut it's down. bloody dry. Yeah. I'm shutting down. I'm, yeah. I'm going into hibernation early. So. And thank God they do. Otherwise, yeah. they'd be there yeah. trying to sustain themselves and pump exactly. water and uh, exactly. it'll go to the, yep. go to the shit. Yep. Tell me about the Silvo um, pasture stuff you've been doing. You're doing some websites every once a week at the moment. You no, we, 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 look, I, uh, the Silvo pasture f- webinar grew out of um, wanting to run a uh, look. It was very raw uh, coming out of 2019, and uh, I was hoping to to be able to get people on the place here. Um, very early on, um, and because the differences were quite stark, um, and uh, so we wanted a field day. We wanted an on-farm field day, and we wanted to, to. I wanted to talk, talk, and show, and have other people show all the stuff we're doing with trees, uh, whether it's the just you know from the planting to the harvesting, the maintenance, and mm. and and people do forget that there's a lot of maintenance that. Go, gets left out with um, with trees. I mean, they can be just left to their own devices, but expect you know nature to take its course in dealing with that maintenance. And we've seen that you know with all the with all the trees that have died out, thinned out in um, in, in the natives as well. You know some of the the areas that had uh, re-sprouted. You know with with lots of lots of regrowth and uh, and then but but Mother Nature's still managed to. To thin those out, and uh, people are freaking out because there's you know there's all these dead trees and gums. I don't mean, know. We had a lot of wattles <laughs> that turned up their toes um, in that summer. Did you <laughs> were, were gums as well? Oh, a whole yeah. whole range. Yeah, 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 whole range. And look, I'm not I'm not too I'm not too worried. Uh, I think you know what what's going to survive is going to survive. And, mm. um, 
But, uh, yeah, so the Silver Pasture Field Day was originally an on-farm demo day. Um, uh, due to the due to COVID, we, we postponed that a year, um, and the seasons just got better and better. <laughs> so it's, uh, the, the, the starkness isn't yeah. quite there. But uh, there was still plenty to talk about, and now we're seeing the uh, now we're seeing the you know the mice plague, and we're we're mm. seeing the all the birds on the place here doing their bit, and the snake. I'm sure the the few snakes we have seen have been very fat and fat. slow. <laughs> so, yeah. Are you so, seeing much mice activity? I don't know in the paddock or in the house. Yeah, yes. Houses, yeah. Yeah. I don't know. You notice on all the doors here. Keep the door closed. For some okay. Mice. <laughs> right. 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 So yeah, no, we've 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 had our fair share of mice. We're not we're not uh, keeping them all. All you know. Right. Uh, but. Um, but yeah, we're seeing the ecosystem services kick in, and uh, and and uh, with the birds doing and the other animals doing their job. It's an interesting term, isn't it? Ecosystem services. I've <clears> never. <throat> it's not about being comfortable. It's, I've always wondered, what's your definition of eco- ecosystem services? It, it, it's all those sh- shade, shelter uh, interactions. You know, the yeah. the, e- the ecosystem, the the sub- the micro from the microorganisms through to your. Through to your quolls and your birds mm. and etc., your large mammals that are supported, that that bring stuff to your the rest of your. In the case of a grazing property, um, you know whether it's spreading spreading seed and a lot of the native seed that gets spread. Um, 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 I yeah. guess it's a. I guess it's the a sh- shade and shelter is, is still you know that's. That's yeah, you're number one. <laughs> I guess the use of the word services. It's almost like it's it's a it's a service. It, I just think it's, it's an interesting word to use. It's a very common you know, phrase, absolutely, yep. and, it's, yep. and it's it's not I'm not yep. being critical of it. It's just yep. interesting the word ecosystem services, which is always sort of yeah, made know. me think about. I don't what, know who they, coined it, but yeah, but, uh, I mean, it's almost feel like that it is serving yeah. us. Yes, and yeah. which is I don't know. I, I I don't feel comfortable about that. It's a free service. Charlie? It is. Oh no, it's absolutely, it's absolutely free. <laughs> but I mean, I, I guess I get to, you know, what's our contribution to that? To, to this, you know, are we, is it reciprocated? It's a respect, yeah. of, of, of those, and it's and it's continuing to, you know, maintain those ecosystems. That <laughs> no, use the word services. Go on, don't be shy now. <laughs> no, I'm glad it's come up because I, I've always. I've well, never... we, we could talk about regenerative ag too, couldn't yeah, we? Yeah, we could. That, that's that's a pretty new term. For, I mean, <laughs> it's new and it's very broad, and and yeah, very broad. And then you know, everyone's got their own definition, which mm. is which mm. is good, I think. Yeah, and definitely. It's about being comfortable. It's, it is broad. And really, what I mean, mm. ecosystem services as a concept is, you know, dovetailed with regenerative ag, whatever that yeah. definition is too. Well, it's all well, the same stuff, well, isn't well, it? Really? Yeah, yeah. And look, silver pasture is another one. So, now tell us why, about that. Why, why did you why did you choose silver pasture? Isn't that just agroforestry? Well, well, th- yeah, that's right. And like, yeah. uh, did you tell me? I mean, yeah. well, it's well, trees. Here's another one: agroecology. Uh, 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 or syntropic forestry. That's it. Um, for, oh God, there's there's so many. I was talking to T- uh, Tammy Jonas. Permaculture. Who? Permaculture. Yeah, it's another one. No, they've got to be separate. No, we have to be in the church of this or that. Now, it was interesting um, talking to Tammy Jonas down at Victoria the other day, and yes. she was very uh, – it was, it was a great conversation. I think we had probably more chats off, off air, but interesting conversation around the use of the word – so the, the term regenerative agriculture, in her view, um, and I'm not being critical of anyone, just it was a really good chat. Yeah. And I had the first time I'd really sort of had thought about it, uh, yeah. And she was saying regenerative ag as a phrase or as a concept yeah. to her is very different from um, agroecology. She, they are advocates of mm. and proponents of agroecology, not regenerative mm-hmm. agriculture. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I don't know. I, I, we didn't, it wasn't. Yeah. Well, there's land care as well. Yeah. And, and, and there's sustainable farming and there's eco, it's conservation farming. ecological farming. That's a yeah. big one in in Europe, obviously, bio, biological farming. Yeah, biologic. Bio. <laughs> what is, what, what's, how's your French? C'est pas mal. No, I won't, no, I better not. Is it good? Because <laughs> is it good? Will, I get by. I can get Do by. You, so yeah. if you dro- were dropped in Paris, you could yeah. you could order a croissant. Yeah, yeah no worries, mate. <laughs> <laughs> but oh, just, just, over, just on that one. Uh, croissant, s'il vous plaît. Oh, sure, she's showing off now. You, now, well, I don't know. I, was, I think someone was just trying to make me look silly, but someone said years ago, if you want to sort of sound more French, purse your lips more. <laughs> uh-huh. 
<laughs> Bonjour. I'm not sure if it works and just what just makes it look silly. But when I was over there many years ago, it was segueing a little bit, but why not? Um, in um, in where well, in France, that's right. Yep. And I was cruising around, and someone someone gave me the best tip ever, and they said, "Don't ever go into somewhere and say and ask someone if they speak speak English." No. Say speak really bad of, French first. Well, yes, we'll say "Parlez-vous Australian," <laughs> and then they go, "Oh, I, most of them." Sometimes they just thought you being yeah. dill and just ignored yeah. you, yeah. but most of the time they go, "Oh, we, we," you know, they they would. The, not saying you were English was a ben, was a really good yes. thing. Yeah, my dad relied on the uh, Wallabies actually. Oh, did he put Wallaby jersey on or something? Yeah, or he said, you know, Wallabies, uh, uh, <laughs> boing boing, kangaroo, <laughs> football, <laughs> Rug, rugby, with his rugby. Li- sorry, with I can't his, say football. No, with rugby, his um, with his lips pursed, <laughs> rugby. <laughs> oh, my dad, yeah, really, um, the Wallabies got my parents everywhere in France. So. Oh, that's gold. I must make sure I take over my. Actually, I, I don't know if I've got a Wallaby jersey, as in like a <laughs> souvenir one. I've, I've the Burua Goldies. <laughs> Um, uh, have a green and gold jersey, yeah. so I reckon I'd probably get away with it. They'd probably reckon <laughs> I was a wallaby. Yeah. Um, oh, I've got another football story, but I won't tell you now. Um, so, f- uh, have you, why have we gone to the French? Oh, biologique. Biology. Biology. <laughs> so I even sound in the French then. Um, so, yeah, no, it's interesting that the, you know, the use of language and the sort of demarcation or the, the terminologies. Yes. Can be um, misguiding. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Not. not yes. Oh, yes. It is. Um, mm. I may not understand. Blinkering. Blinkering. Yeah. yeah. It's like. Oh no. No. I don't use that word. I use this. And that's mm. fine. Absolutely. Mm. It's, I just find it interesting that um, that that is a thing. That, yeah. that, that 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 there's you know. And you've got people who love yeah. permaculture and they are in the yeah. school. But and there are yeah. people who go. Oh my god. Like. Mm. Yeah. That's <clears throat> you don't do. It's no. interesting. Yeah. It sort of can be. Well, um, silver, silver pasture is not. Uh, it was. It's. It's kind of a newish term. It's not wide. A widespread. You know, plenty of people have no idea what it mm-hmm. means. So, but it has the word pasture in there. Yeah. And I was hoping that uh, it would highlight to graziers that uh, it was a this form of agroforestry. You know, yeah. it, it is. A, you know, we're recognising pastures as a major part of agroforestry. I've, Did you uh, make it up? Did you coin the term? No. <laughs> No. <laughs> no, if you I had, did. yeah, I discovered it. No, <laughs> no. <laughs> like your mum and dad discovered yeah, it. That's right. My God, the Taylor family is so talented. They're explorers. No, to, no, um, no, so, no, where, no. where did it come from? Uh, I, have, I have no idea. It's it's been around forever. Okay. It's, um, look, uh, God, I haven't got his name here. There is a, uh, there is an American author that's just published a book called Silver Pasture. Yeah. Um, and it's uh, it does it does cover it. Pretty well, but it's you know it's it's just another form of agroforestry. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, the investment schemes back in the, was that back in the early two thousands and in in that that used agroforestry, um, and but it was essentially just monocrop forestry. Yeah. They were purchasing farms and putting trees on, and uh, and then with the collapse of a lot of those managed investment schemes, and um, because it was very poorly done. Forestry, even as forestry, it wasn't even agroforestry, but but uh, that I think that really soured the term forestry yeah. um, for a lot of people, and it didn't matter whether it was agroforestry or um, I still have to correct that every time type it type it in Microsoft Word. There's a, they they doesn't recognise agroforestry. Does it, it try and turn into yeah. agro something? I did something. <laughs> it's yeah, right. Name. So ag- agroforestry is. Uh, yeah, still, uh, st- still, you know, f- fully understood. You know, people still see uh, it. You know, forestry as they see that part of the word, and they yeah. miss the, you know, even agriculture. You know, people miss the culture part. Yeah, good, um, cool. And um, so, yeah, there's a, you know, and and like I said, our local tree mentoring uh, group of people is it's the agri woodlands network it's not the agri forestry network because yep. a lot of a lot of people recognize you know the open woodlands of the tablelands and uh, that's easier for them to, to yeah. understand so yeah there's a lot there's a lot in so anyway that's where that's why we use silvo pasture 
Um, and what, what is all it? the resources on there on our so we've got silverpasture.com.au. Is, oh, okay, nice. Is is hope we're hoping to bring together a lot of resources of of um, tree, trees on farms and agro and agroforestry. You know, there's stuff that Australian Agroforestry Foundation, Bush Rowan, what, what Rowan Reid talked about, but also a lot of the ecosystem services stuff that Nick Reid talked about and the biodiversity side of things, whether it's the seed collecting or the um, you know, and the, or, or the timber side of things, and uh, or you know whether it's cut plants, all the all those things that relate to to trees and farms and uh, or, or woody plants on farms, and truly really uh, that the, provide those extra two strata layers that yeah. that, that pastures are yep. are missing. You know, I, I I watched a very good documentary on uh, called Guardians of the Grasslands. Oh yeah, on the um the uh, the ranches that that manage the the grassland to the central central uh, Canada, Sask- southern Sask- Saskatchewan, and um, yeah, it was a very great it was a it was a great little documentary, very emotional, um, talking about you know the loss of the bison out of those grasslands, and mm. we'll put and that how, in the show links. How cattle were uh, cattle are now you know taking that place in yeah. terms of promoting actually the diversity of the the pastures those, but. Uh, I don't know. I still really struggle looking at uh, those really bare landscapes and wondering actually whether whether trees, t- you know, can still have a place in those areas because we're still talking, uh, you know, talking people and and animals that that, that require shelter, and um, and uh, and and all the you know Nick Reed again, you know, in his presentation yesterday put up some very very comprehensive data on. On, on the value, you know, when you when you incorporate trees in a pasture system, mm. you the, va- the 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 production and the profit you're making out of out of pasture drops, but the overall the overall value of the la- of the system goes up. Yeah. So um, a lot of people sort of uh, there's a, there's a little bit of a compromise yeah. between having the yeah. two systems totally. together, but the overall value yeah. is greater than the one plus one equals three. Mm. Um, so where can people, do you want more people on the webinar? As in? Um, look, that, that was, we've, we're done now. Oh, no, okay. We've just had two, we just had two that replaced. Oh, what, how rude. How about you do some more for our <laughs> listeners? We, we, look, it was a, it was a, it was a starting point for Southern Unreal. New England Landcare. We hadn't run any, uh, they hadn't run any webinars, okay. hosted any webinars. Yeah. A lot of us were newbies on, uh, on Zoom and and uh, presenting live from in the field, that was a challenge. I had. Yeah. I had oh, you're in, you said you're in, the, you're in the paddock. I was actually out in the paddock on your phone um, because I was desperately wanting to to get people out there in the forest. Yeah. And um, and that uh, it's it's never the same just on a screen. But no. um, if I'd tripped over and and landed on my face, it would have been real. It would have all been live, <laughs> and it had broken. It well and truly demonstrated the, the amount of woody. The danger, the, the danger the, in the, the forest. The, the woody debris under my feet. Now, talking about forests and trees, um, we can't have a conversation without talking about Rowan Reed, can we? Do you want to, no, 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 no. It's actually, uh, yeah, Rowan. Uh, our, our connection with Rowan does go back a long, a long way as well, uh, which is funny because. Uh, when he was up here about six years ago running the Master Tree Growers courses, um, he actually had a, he had a big project at the time. Um, he'd got well, 700000 I think, from, from uh, Innovation in Farming. Um, uh, wanted, he wanted to, to, to run a pilot of his agri you know, agroforestry mentoring networks. Um, obviously, in the Otways, agroforestry is a very viable uh, vibrant industry down there, very good country for growing trees. They're close to markets, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Mm. But uh, uh, they've struggled to again. You know, there's no there's no support for extension work in not there's very little support for extension work in forestry. So they've been relying very much on the land care network. Mm. Um, at the time when we found out about this pilot project, uh, Southern New England Landcare up here too were very, very squeezed for funds to, to keep our extension people going, which are, you know, the lifeblood of, of, of the network, uh, keeping people connected and, um, and, and organising 
field get-togethers and etc. It just takes, you know, you need those people to organise those things sometimes. Mm. And um, <clears throat> so we were, uh, I was on the board of Snelk and we were looking for, you know, I'd ideas that we could keep the organisation going and we came across the agri the agroforestry mentoring network and uh, peer group mentors and uh, and we thought that sounded like a great way of, of ensuring that we didn't lose uh, all the knowledge uh, that we had because if Snell had closed up their doors there would have been a huge amount of uh, knowledge lost um, so we, uh, we 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 and joined with uh, with Rowan on that project, and when Rowan came up to to uh, run the uh, agri the master tree growers courses up here, he was uh, on our farm, and um, and and my mum said, "Oh, you've you've been here before," and uh, and Rowan was like, "Nope, nope, never been here before. No, nope, don't remember that." And mm. uh, anyway, the next day, my my mother brought a photo out of Rowan Rowan Reed on our farm. Um, <laughs> lecturing on trees. No way. The property yeah, had changed. Yeah, the property, yeah. our property, had changed so much yeah. that he was absolutely sure he'd never seen them. Wow, that's before. cool, isn't it? <laughs> so, and he'd be uh, pretty was, astute sort of fellow too. That right? was uh, it was funny, but um, but yeah. So that uh, that Agri Woodland Network we have now, uh, we've got about fifteen on mentors and. Right that have the knowledge have been on a lot of the properties that we've been mentoring on now. So they also have knowledge of those properties as well. But mm. that's all, all uh, we're, we're basically sleeping agents. There's, mm. no, uh, there's no office or car or mobile phone to, yeah. to keep us employed, but we're all, we're all local farmers and academics and et cetera that are uh, involved in that, nurserymen and orchard, yep. orchardists and... And a, a wide range. And you're servicing the New England? Is that sort of the, the, your, your uh, membership of your zone? Yeah, yeah, a lot of New England. We've we've gone as far as Tamworth and up to to Glen and out yeah. down to now and Dock and yeah. so all over the place. Part of the, the for, for those that don't know, part of the uh, the uh, mentoring process is uh, normally if you employ an agronomist or, a, or you are in land care extension officer or someone to come and advise you, it's often just one person and uh, they might be brilliant but it's still just one person mm. and it's, uh, there's potentially a biased view there. So part of the, agri the, the mentoring process we have, there's, there's a minimum of three people go out to any any yeah. any one client so you never get you never get a, a single view and it's it's mentoring it's not yeah. not consulting yeah. so we're yeah. listening to to the ideas of the landholders and the, and what they want to do mm -hmm. uh, and, and so it's it's putting the power again back in the land mm -hmm. which is you know which, what land care was originally and um, it's uh, but you know it's it's a different beast these days and so is the funding environment. It's a very different Can't beast. So, mm. um, it's all about adapting to the new funding environment, isn't it? Keeping your finger on the pulse and, and where funding's coming from. And Yep, um, you know. Mm. <laughs> yes. So yeah, yeah, lessons yeah. of it too. And, and, uh, and we're aware of that because obviously exotics have never been really covered under any of the tree planting programs. So. No. So, um, Not really um, recognised. No, no, which is, which is why... It, my parents became very good and, and have passed those skills on to me too at yeah. establishing trees as, as cheaply as possible. Yeah. Um, so it's not, you know, not breaking the bank. No. Um, to, to, to go to out and it. plant 250,000 trees tomorrow would, 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 yeah, there wouldn't be many people around that could afford to, <laughs> to yeah. do that. Yeah. Um, so you've got, the, yeah. you've got the, the facilities and nursery sort of, Set up and the no, we re we rely on on external nurseries. Okay. Um, obviously the acorns and, and and some of the other direct seeding we're doing. That's yes. a, that's yeah. seed that we're harvesting on farm now. Yeah. We we propagate some trees ourselves. Yeah. Maybe there's particular special ones that, that, that but uh, but you know there's a couple of the local nurseries, Kentucky Tree Nursery, Armadale um, Tree Group. Um, they they all do propagation and they'll propagate on you know. On, um, yeah, whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. Do you go sneaking around botanic gardens and getting acorns and <laughs> elm seeds and all sorts of stuff? 
Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> is it? Is I don't think. No. I don't I, think I, well, we're both in trouble. And if we are, if it is, because I don't, I do a very similar thing. And we I, haven't found the well of my pine yet. You haven't found it. No. <laughs> Have you got? No. Could you grow one here? Probably. <laughs> probably. Maybe. Probably. I don't know. Might be a bit cold for it. But. I tried it, but I think yeah, it was a bit acid. We're sitting next to the tree up behind the you on the left there. Oh, yeah. I don't know whether you recognise what that is. Um. Oh no! Are you going to test me? No. Think I'm... of the think of the biggest tree in the world. Oh, the um, redwood. Yeah, that's a that's a Californian redwood. That's a sequoia. <sighs> sequoia. You know, it's interesting you say that because I was talking to. Um, I had the pleasure of meeting. Um, I'm going to get his surname wrong. Pape Scott Pape. You know the barefoot investor. He's a uh, yes. In Victoria, yeah. Yep. Pape. Yep. Yep. Um, and. He uh, down there doing a workshop and biodynamic workshop, and he um, wasn't at the workshop, unfortunately, but I'll get him to another one. And he was saying he had, I think the next day was a Saturday or something, he was planting Ape Redwoods on his farm, and it's sort of near, I'm going to get it right, sort of east of Darlesford, so yep. Um, yep. Yeah, sort of colder, come, but yeah. well, probably yeah. not yep. dissimilar to here in terms yep. of the cold and, the, you know, no, probably they get do, warmer they up here. they do have some, um, we did actually try some, Redwoods out on the farm uh, failed dismally. You mean uh, out in the in the paddock? Yes, yeah, yeah, big planting. Uh, and why? What was it? What was it? Too hot? Uh, but <laughs> it was too hot, too dry, too yeah. too cold, too wet. Okay. <laughs> okay. Didn't, no, no, right. it, wasn't, it wasn't too wet. It was just before the 2013-14 drought, and we lost a lot of trees we planted mm. in that planting. And uh, it was the first time I'd ever watered trees twice. Yeah. Um, Big again, you know, part of part of planting trees economically is picking the time yeah. to plant, um, as 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 croppers would know. When do you plant trees? Uh, when, <laughs> normally, Generally. normally we're a spring spring planting, but I'm I'm sowing acorns. I've planted four hundred acorns the other day, and because we just we just had some rain, and yeah. I couldn't do anything else. So I, we had the ground prepared, so we went out in the rain in our raincoats and planted. Planted trees. How do you pre- how do you prepare the site for acorns? Uh, the, they they need a, a fairly good seed bed. So, but uh, most of our tree plantings are you know a double rip and a mound or a, or a rotary hoe, um, and sometimes we we have uh, we'll we'll be spraying out either before or sometimes after. So again, picking our times to to be able to make that. Uh, uh, you know, germination or or the starting of the seedlings uh, as best as possible. So um, you always put the acorns in just as 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 a ungerminated acorn, or do you? Yeah, think, some yeah. some of the some of the acorns. Bill Funk is uh, is someone that we've we've drawn a lot of knowledge on on oaks. Who's off that? In Bill Funk. Bill Funk. Bill Funk. Um, he Billy would Funk. have the biggest collection of oaks in the country. He'd where's have, where's Bill? Know, Can you he's tell? He's just him? south of um, the Grampians near oh, Dunkeld. Cool. Yeah. And uh, when I was living in Melbourne, I visited him a, a number of times. He's got an amazing property. His son Robert, I think, has taken over these days. But uh, but Bill's still propagating. Bobby Funk. That's cool. Billy Funk and Bobby Funk. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. But Bill's uh, Bill's been. Phenomenal in in, mm. in in educating us on oaks, and and we had a we we ran a, an oak field day here a few years back. Um, had a lot of interest actually. Which yeah. was, which Can you was, do another one, please? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> now now that we've had some rain and green grass, it yeah. might be a bit more pleasant. But yeah. But look, uh, the we we learned a lot about some of the red red oaks uh, uh, that, or oh, and some of the oaks out of Mexico are in fire prone areas mm. and the acorns are developed a very thick husk yeah and in our, in our wetter soils here sometimes we uh they, those acorns were rotting and we didn't we didn't realize so oh. so we're either de-husking them and planting them or de-husking them and growing them out in in, in hyco trays for a start wow to to get them going but um um, yeah, it's uh, th- there's a. L- I, I am like I said, I'm propagating a lot as well and putting mm. them in. But uh, um, yeah, so unreal. Uh, and we're we're actually covering them with um, sawdust out of our sawmill, so to just keep the soil moist. Ah, uh, that's over, a little over winter, and it's a yeah. you nice know, nice little bit of organic uh, weed mat. And yeah, um, but we've found the the you know coming out of the end of winter, 
Uh, a lot of the oaks have their roots down 10, 15, 20 centimetres already. Um, if so you plant them now, if we plant them now, it's unreal. Isn't and it? Um, they get get, a, get they, them get them through the spring and the they summer. Get a, yeah, you know that's before they even have a top on them. So mm. it's uh, a quite impressive digging them up um, at the end of winter and seeing how how long those roots are. And, and to think, you know, a lot that we planted this year were ones that had already germinated on the tree, so they were already already a couple of centimetres long. They had a go. I'm, that's, I've never heard of that. Um, I'm just conscious of the time, Michael, and one question that I probably should have put to you earlier, but now's a good time. Anyway, um, is it, were there any, in your journey, were there any sort of points in time that you recall were life-changing, you know, big catalyst, oh, catalytic so moments. Yeah, so many, so many points. Um, <clears throat> um, the bigger the bigger ones have been more recent. Um, uh, I, I guess coming back from Melbourne, um, Dad says, you were like an alien when you came back here. And, uh, yeah, in what way? I just I'd been living in the city and yeah, right. sipping coffees at cafes and <laughs> being an engineer. You like tippy tying right, around, riding spiders. elevators in a in a suit and tie. And, yeah, um, it was a very different. It's a very different life. And despite you know, I, I would be out kayaking or climbing and something every weekend. But um, but still living in the city, you you, you get pretty. Um, uh, you, you get a bit you, soft. You get you get a bit soft. <laughs> yeah, I don't want to say that. I've got a lot of mates in the city that are pretty, that are pretty I'm sure tough, tough, tougher than me, mate. But, <laughs> but yeah, you, you you don't you know the parks are the parks the green the grass is green in the parks and there's mm. all the gardens seem to be growing just fine and the the water's coming out of the tap and mm. and um, is that going to blow? Oh no, she's no, all right. We're nearly there anyway. And um, but yeah, you, you so coming back to the farm, definitely I questioned everything. Everything about the farm. Why are we? Why do we shear now? Why are we? Why are mm. we drenching this often? Why are we? Why are we putting a fence there? Why are we? Why do we have to maintain all the gates? Mm. <laughs> yeah. Just, just all these, all these questions. I, I definitely came back questioning a lot more than maybe if I'd, uh, if I'd just come straight out of school and yeah. straight onto the farm and and hadn't been away and seen how the how the rest of the world lives and. Um, so so that was that was the first first point um and then yeah i guess the next major one was after i'd really well and truly taken over um look we did have a we did have a little comma in our in our life on the farm we we actually went and lived in france for for a year um and that was uh, that was also a, a very re- reflective time on on you know what what we were doing both of us uh, Millie and her professional life she she works in IT and in business intelligence and and that's so remote you know so yeah. removed from the farm so um, but yeah it was a good a good opportunity to get away again and um, um, it was a good time to go there was a, there was a mini a mini drought that year there's I remember seeing we'd, we'd shorn, we 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 shear at the end of July, and but and we went over. One of the conditions of going over was uh, my dad was still able to caretake the place, and I had to leave after shearing, and I had to get back before shearing. That was a year. That was the that was the year. So um, um, yeah, I remember seeing all the the photos of of the red sheep um, from the dust again. Uh. So dust dust has featured quite a bit. Um, again, 2013-14 uh, was uh, it, the drought wasn't as widespread, but it was it was it, we we were we were just over 300 mil for the year here, but mm. it was pretty pretty bad. Uh, and we were seeing drying events that we hadn't seen that my dad had never seen. So he'd heard about in my grandfather's time, but. Um, and then, um, so already, you know, and, and I tried to, to feed my way through that. And, and after the 80s drought, I think uh, my parents had got into a little bit of a habit of supplementary feeding because uh, it was uh, it had become a lot easier to just get on the phone and you'd order the grain and, and call the call the grain in and... and, and it quickly yeah, turns into it's, it's, sub, 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 it's, substitutional yeah, feeding. That, that's right. So we, uh, we, we were still doing that and... Um, and I hadn't 
hadn't questioned that maybe as much as I should have, but but that drought really, really hammered it home for me, and I said I don't want to be doing that again. And um, a lot of uh, again a lot of research and a lot of ad- advice from from people that know better than I do um, was able to show that we can we can do this in the pastures. We can feed the feed the animals full time off the pastures. We don't need to to be dribbling gold coins out the back of the ute mm. um, onto the paddock. And, um, and uh, yeah, we, uh, yeah, then we, we, we gradually drifted into the 2019 drought and, um, and I kept reducing my stock numbers. I, look, there's, there's many different strategies in getting through droughts and, and I don't discount any of them. And I think um, they've all got their, their place depending on where you are in life and, and how your farm's set up, how you, what your family structure is, or your staff structure, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And but I'm 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 just one person here running the place by myself. So if uh, if there's you know stock feeding to do every day, it's that falls on my head. Uh, and um, um, your yeah, choice, your I managed to get through to shearing without feeding. Yeah. Um, so that's and, not your feed cut over there. No. <laughs> <laughs> I won't say it. <laughs> well, it's not yours. There, there we go. <laughs> Somebody's still feeding. Someone's uh, still feeding. And there's, there seems to be feed on the ground. There's a hell of a lot been, of feed on the ground. Yeah. We, we, we were doing, you know, over a kilo a day on the cattle we got last year through winter, and mm. I was pretty, pretty happy winter. with that. Yeah, cool. And, um, um, and that's just off, off pasture. So we, we, we put out a little bit of mineral supplement now. Um, um, for, to to account for those deficiencies that we're, our inputs have been chicken manure and gypsum. Um, so we, there's we know that you know we know that there has to be if there's you know a certain amount of outputs there has to be inputs replacing, replacing those. But um, but yeah, we managed to get through. We 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 ended up having to feed sheep for a few months, lambing ewes, um, but we didn't feed cattle. Uh, we had enough water this time. We got through on the water, but uh, look, that 2019 drought just really, really hammered it home on how, how much soil's being lost um, um, if we don't manage our ground cover, and um, mm-hmm. to, to be sitting in where we are sitting today and just being, seeing seeing the dust storms roll by, um, was you know was. Um, yeah, pretty, 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 pretty dramatic. Uh, it's hard to imagine <laughs> and the looking smoke at that now. And the, you know? It's really hard to mm-hmm. imagine mm-hmm. just now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, really hard to imagine. But um, when you dig down, uh, when you look at the diversity in the pastures now, it's that there, there, there is plenty of measurables there. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's. But yeah, that those those were my few turning points. Um, mm-hmm. My parents definitely gave me the tools, and my grandparents the inspiration to. To, to get to where we are now and uh, we know now that uh, you know like I said my parents wander around the paddock and they just can't believe what they've <laughs> what's grown out of those, all those trees that they planted um, so we know now uh, it's not actually that long to establish trees um, and change change you know the property dramatically and um, you know um, the turnaround is it can can be done you know a lot quicker it can't be done overnight and and there'll be changes ongoing you know 20 30 40 50 years down the track mm. the, like i said it's a very modified landscape we're living in so it's like a big laboratory you're still seeing those changes and mm. and leveraging those observation skills so, and, and relying on the science to maybe explain it if it needs explaining or or not <laughs> Well, you're leaving a wonderful legacy here for not just your children and family, Michael, but for the world, from what I can see. Now, I reckon we might have time, if I get packed up quick enough, to, um, I'd love to do, can we go somewhere, can we, is there somewhere close that gives it, is a really good one-stop yep. look around? Maybe your yep. oak, is there some little oak grove or something? Um, there's there's some very nice little oak groves. There's We could go to the cocktail bar. Um, <laughs> in, 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 the co- in the morning, the cocktail bar overlooks the farm. Yeah, and um, that's not far away. It's not far away. Okay, well maybe we do that because I'd love I'd, I'd I'd love to not um, leave. 
we could nearly hop up there in our one boot. <laughs> we better move it to be socks back on. Tell you what I'll do. Um, I'll, um, I'll get mm. packed up first. Mm. We can probably have this conversation off air, can we? <laughs> Thanks, Charlie. Let's wrap it up. Um, that was wonderful, Michael. Thank you so much for your time on this beautiful autumn day here. Mm. And just before my microphone falls over, um, yours is just hang on there. I've noticed you've actually lowered your chair so you don't have to move the mic. I've sagged into the mic. <laughs> Looking very uncomfortable there, but that was wonderful. I hope we can do this again and have a um, and do a much better look around yeah. and, and visit some of and, your and, and thank some you. of your tr- some of your tree growing workshops that you've just promised you're going to put on. <laughs> uh, uh, look, I'm very much, very much getting my well, own backyard in order. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no. Look, it's, it, it, but uh, it, it, we have an open gate policy here. We haven't cool. even touched on on all the uh, all the all the wool stuff that we've been involved in, but. Oh. But uh, ethical, ethically grown, ecologically grown wool is a big thing, um, and yeah, natural fibres. So, but we have an open open gate policy for for anybody that wants to yeah. to come and see see the place, see where see, see where our sheep live, see where our cattle live, see where we live. It's, yeah. um, it, it it sometimes can be tiring, but it's very rewarding being able to share share it, and and it's. Um, just as it's very rewarding hearing the stories that you share, Charlie. I think you're doing a great job. Well, thank you for being part of that <clears throat> that that um, uh, bunch of stories, and I, I enjoy doing it because, and it's an easy job because people like you and others and my guests, you know, they they're very generous with their time and they're generous with their the their experiences and, and stories, and that's really um, I think it's important that other people hear that and go, okay, that that I can do that. It's, you know. It can be done. So well, I, I couldn't have done it without my family. Oh, of course, <laughs> my my all the mistakes my my ancestors made. And, Sounds like um, an Academy Award <laughs> acceptance speech. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is. You, this is an look at this award you've got out here. It's, it's, it's magic. It's pretty rewarding. Oh, totally. Yeah. Totally. We've, we've we've tried, like I said, we've tried living a few different places, yeah. and we, we keep coming back you here. Come home. That's good, and may you stay for. There's not even a you. beach here. <laughs> That's right. You got a kayak in that bloody trough down there. Um, <laughs> let's let's wrap it up, Michael. Lovely to chat, and uh, I hope to see you again very soon. Okay, thanks, Charlie. And next week on the Regenerative Journey, uh, we get to speak with Amelia Nolan at Alkina Wine Estate in the Barossa Valley of South Australia, um, doing some fascinating work and, and a really good example of using. Um, cutting-edge technology in a very ancient um, industry of winemaking and grape growing. Stay tuned for next week's episode, uh, and I hope you enjoy the interview I had with Amelia Nolan, Nolan as much as I did next week on The Regenerative Journey. This podcast is produced by Rhys Jones at Jaeger Media. If you enjoyed this episode, please feel free to subscribe, share, rate and review. For more episode information, please head over to www.charliearnett.com.au.